Well, friends, when I was a kid, like nine, ten years old, I loved Ripley's Believe It or Not. <laughs> Robert L. Ripley was born Christmas Day of 1893 in Santa Rosa, California, and at 16 years old, he started off as a sports cartoonist. But soon, his interest as a reporter took him all over the world to more than 200 countries. You see, he was insanely curious, a kind of modern day Marco Polo. Of course, my parents would have preferred that I spent my allowance on something else, but I loved Ripley's Believe It or Not comic books. So, I mean, what kid didn't, right? It was a chance to explore the world, especially the bizarre and the unusual. <laughs> And though I didn't realize it at the time, every story, every picture brought with it a faith decision. Did I believe it or not? Was that Fiji mermaid real or just another fish story? A shrunken head the size of a lemon? <laughs> a man eight feet, 11 inches tall. I looked him up later, he was real, Wadlow the giant, a two-headed cow, <laughs> not so sure. As a 10-year-old, though, I believed it all. I was no doubting Thomas, no way. I had not yet learned the important skill of skepticism. Thomas' fellow disciples came to him with this fantastic story. Jesus is risen from the dead. Thomas's response is quite honest. I'm not sure I can buy that. I mean, I need more information. So put yourself in his shoes. What would you think? You might have some doubts too, right? And I think Thomas has walked the corridors of history for way too long with this pejorative moniker around his neck, Doubting Thomas. I think it's time to rehabilitate his reputation. There's actually a modern group uh, I found on the internet called DTA, Doubting Thomas Anonymous. <laughs> it's people who are simply not satisfied with blind faith. And I was, I was thinking about joining, you know. Precious Reb, my lovely wife and gifted pastor herself, used to uh, uh, greet congregations that she served with this wonderful greeting that she crafted. Well, actually, she learned some of this from Ann Russ, who was a pastor down in Argenta, but she crafted most of this. She said, welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Iowa, Kansas. Welcome to all who have no church home and, or are seeking a new home. Welcome to singles and couples and families of all shapes and sizes. Welcome to those who come seeking peace and to those who have peace to share. Welcome to those who are joyful and to those who are sad. Welcome to believers and to doubters. And a special welcome to doubting believers. Welcome to all who have come seeking God and to all who have come seeking merely to appease someone in their household. <laughs> Welcome to friends and to strangers, for we are all the family of God. First Presbyterian Church is a house of God, and everyone is welcome here. <laughs> I loved it when she would do that, and for me, it was that, and a special welcome to doubting believers. I, I think thought she was talking to me. That's what really resonated. That said, I think Thomas gets a bad rap via a much too casual reading of scripture. We do realize that today's gospel lesson is not the only time that we hear about Thomas in scripture. Maybe Thomas could teach us something about what it means to follow Jesus. Now, if we want to understand Thomas, we need to look around a little bit, take the death of Lazarus, his friend, Jesus' friend Lazarus, in John chapter 11. After hearing that Lazarus had died, Jesus tells the disciples that it's time to uh, that his time has come and that they need to go down to Bethany so that they might comfort 
Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, and the rest of the family. The disciples hardly believe what Jesus is saying. Are, are you crazy, man? Uh, going down to Bethany, only a couple of miles from Jerusalem? I mean, that could be very dangerous. And that's when Thomas chimes in boldly. Let us also go that we may die with Jesus. Wow. Sounds like real courage and commitment to me. Thomas is someone who's willing to lay down his own life in solidarity with Jesus' ministry. And I wonder, is that courage, that willingness to die, somehow diminished later on um, when the, in, in the wake of the resurrection story? I mean, why, why don't we remember this fella as courageous Thomas instead of doubting Thomas? I don't think we can allow one report to trump another. Here's what I think. As followers of Jesus, every day we must decide if we want to be God's scorekeepers or God's grace givers. Multiple glimpses of Thomas in Scripture remind us, I think, that when judging a person's character, there's more to a person than just today's convenient soundbite. The next time we hear about Thomas is in John chapter 14. And here Jesus speaks rather cryptically about going away, going somewhere to prepare a heavenly place where, where he will welcome his disciples and followers. Now remember that our understanding of Jesus has developed over centuries here. So try putting yourself back there and then, please. I do love Thomas's honesty. I love his integrity in this particular situation. I, I see myself in him so much. Their, their teacher is talking about heaven, and I don't think anybody has a clue what Jesus is talking about. Now, by the way, I felt that way most of my first year in seminary. Uh, Thomas has the courage to inquire, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And I'm thinking that Jesus, he didn't say it, but I'm thinking he's thinking, Thomas, thank you for that question. A question that encourages Jesus to elaborate. Thanks to Thomas, we receive one of the most memorable passages in the New Testament. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's through me, my, my life, my death, my resurrection, that you will learn the way to God. As you all can imagine, in seminary, I ask a lot of questions. Sometimes I ask so many questions that I suspect that classmates were thinking, well, let's hear from somebody else now. However, I also suspect that many of my classmates, though, out of respect for their august professors, that uh, they shouldn't ask so many questions. Well, why not? Here's the deal. I, I, I went to seminary to learn and to grow, and I refused to just sit there in class with most of us lost and so intimidated uh, that we couldn't even ask questions. So Thomas's honesty and integrity remain uh, an excellent model for learning, I think, though it's not always revered in the halls of academia. We carry it out in the real world, too. Don't ask too many questions. Hey, if you don't agree with us, you're probably wrong. Thomas's willingness to ask for clarification and verification is a true gift to the church, I think. I'm, I'm guessing that he inspired that early church mantra that you've heard sometimes, I believe, bless me in my unbelief. Why have so many in the body of Christ developed this uh, negative attitude toward questions and doubts? I mean, didn't we learn anything from our Jewish roots uh, it, uh, of Christianity? I did ask uh, one of my Jewish cousins one time, why do y'all always add, answer a question with another question? Uh, his response was priceless, why not? <laughs> so religious groups counterpose doubt uh, as the antithesis of faith, doubt versus faith. This is a false dichotomy. The real enemy of faith is indifference, my friends, not doubt. 
I believe that doubt plays a constructive and a positive role in the development and nurturing of faith. Years ago, a young man in my junior high Sunday school class asked, kept asking, if God's so good, how come there's so much crap in the world? <laughs> That's a good question. Theologians call that the odyssey, by the way. Some spend their entire lives exploring the problem of evil. Why does God allow it? Years later, I ran into this particular young man in an airport, and I said, well, what? I didn't even recognize him. He said, do you remember me? And I said, no. He said, uh, what? Um, introduced himself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what are you up to these days? He said, I'm in seminary now. <laughs> wow. Wow. I refuse to be part of a church that is convinced that we possess all the truth. And if you don't agree with us, then you're wrong. I love what some people have come to call the three least used words in religious vocabulary. You know what they are? I, I don't know. People would come and ask me in my study sometimes, what's heaven like? I say, I don't really know. Uh, I mean, there's some hints. I know it's gotta be better in here. <laughs> Often we don't acknowledge, and the way we Presbyterians have endured uh, this celebration is using a big tent approach. We Presbyterians have a winsome way. While we are exploring, we can agree to disagree, and we can still share a sacred meal together at the Lord's table. I believe Einstein uh, said these three words often with conviction. I don't know. They're actually the mark of an intelligent person, I think. Why should a faith journey ever rob us of our humanness, of our intelligence, of our skepticism? 12th century theologian Anselm called this way of life faith seeking understanding. When exploring who God is and who we are in relationship with God and each other, sometimes that exploration is enough. And the Hebrews have a word for this, dayenu. It's a powerful Hebrew word that the, our Jewish cousins use at the Seder table. If you've ever sat at a Seder uh, with them, uh, they, they, they sing dayenu. It's enough. It's enough that God makes the journey with us and for us all the way. When our faith needs reinforcement, I can think of nothing better than the tangible experience of reality, which is exactly what Thomas was asking for. Let's not fault him for that. Essentially, Thomas the skeptic is saying, let me encounter the risen Christ the way you already have. It is good to experience this God with us, among us, who always meets us where we are, not where we ought to be. You know, every congregation is filled with people who are wrestling with unresolved issues of faith. By the way, that usually includes the preacher. A large part of my calling as a teaching elder uh, was the special training in transitional ministry, first at IBM uh, as a layperson and then later on in the Presbyterian Church. And, and it's been my calling mostly to help sessions create a safe environment where doubt and fear can be raised without questioners being made to feel rejected or like second-class citizens. Precious Rev sings this wonderful song by Janice Stanfield. I love it when she sings it. Maybe we'll get her to come here and sing it for you all sometime. The title says it all. I'm not lost, I'm exploring. <laughs> Friends in Christ, this morning, I hold before you one of the Bible's great faith heroes, Thomas the Skeptic, a spiritual hero who had the courage to admit that he didn't understand it all. He didn't have it all figured out. And he wasn't afraid to ask a few questions. So let's not be folks who think that we have to have all the answers. Instead, let's be people who hold on to that measure of faith that's made real in the relationship, in, in the crucible of thoughtful questions and concerns and a modicum of skepticism about life and death and resurrection. 
You see, real faith is better shaped by honest questions than certain answers. And it always happens in relationship with God and Jesus Christ. Let's call that faith seeking understanding. It was Thomas's way, and we have John to thank for recording this enigmatic story, the story which teaches us that doubts may not always lead to answers, but doubts well explored and carefully investigated almost always lead to spiritual growth. Believe it or not, <laughs> and now to God be all glory forever and ever. And the people of God said, 